I'm, I'm glad uh, to see you all here. I had a chance to walk a little bit and meet a few of you all. Very interesting people out there. I have the honor this evening of kicking off our event season with one book, one city, Powder Springs. So welcome all you this evening. I'm going to talk about a few things. We'll give yourselves a round of applause for being part of our community this event. Uh, my job is to introduce our speaker. I know you all can read, and you can see Matthew Quick. I mean, I know you all can read, so I don't have to tell you what his name is, but I'm going to talk about him very briefly. But before I do that, I want to give a few shout outs to uh, some folks that have made this happen. First of all, our Powder Springs Library, you're going to hear from the manager soon, but that team has worked to help put this together. We have members here from the Powder Springs Book Club. They are a rowdy bunch, I just want to tell you that. <laughs> Julia's Bookstore Club, a little bit more mellow. Um, we also have uh, the one and only, she's going to be emceeing this, Julia, who is the bookstore owner of the Bookworm. So together, <laughs> the Powder Springs Library and the Bookworm Bookstore have put this together so you all could have access to a real live author. Now, let's talk about our author. Uh, Mr. Matthew Quick. Now, I tried to do some research on him and find out stuff, and I realized, wow, too many things to talk about. Now, he's a pretty humble guy. Had a chance to speak with him myself across the street. But let me tell you who we have in our backyard. He is a New York Times best-selling author of the book, The Silver Lining Playbook. He's also written The Good Luck of Right Now, Love May Fail, The Reason You Are Alive. He's also written four young adult novels. His work has been translated into more than 30 languages. I can only speak one, okay? But he's got 30 languages. I didn't know that many languages like this. I need to read more. Um, he is also a Penn Hemingway Award honorable mention was a Los Angeles Times Book Prize finalist, a New York Times Book Review Editor's Choice, and a lot more. But this one stands out. The Hollywood Reporter has named him a one of Hollywood's 25 most powerful authors. He lives with his wife, another novelist, Ms. Alicia Vesson, on the North Carolina out of France. I gotta come there, so Matthew, please invite me. But, Without any further delay, I would like to bring up our guest speaker to the city of Powder Springs. I want y'all to join me in giving him and Julia our MC for the questions portion and also our host for this. One book, one city. Let me back up. I got still script. Jennifer's coming up to talk about our wonderful library. She's doing that part. So anyway, thank you all for coming. I've given an intro. You know who he is. At this time, I'm going to pass the mic to Jennifer. Come on up, Jennifer. doing one book, one discussion, and it's been a really enjoyable experience working with the city and the book club. Um, this is our adult portion. We are actually going to be doing one with children. It's the October. The title we chose is Wild Sea Witch, so look out for that. Um, there's a lot of good things happening in the library. If you guys like book clubs, we have two book clubs. One is a mystery, one is a suspense, and we're also going to be starting a third book club. This is going to be an evening book club. We're going to talk about it's not going to be set genre, it'll be different genres. And we have a lot of other events going on at the library for adults and for children. We're going to be starting a book club for children. We have crafts in the afternoon on Thursdays. So um, stop by my booth and get a brochure if you guys are interested. I also wanted to say that um, we're going to be doing a raffle drawing. So we're going to be coming around with, with tickets. Um, Members from Julia's bookstore purchased an extra copy of the book for us to hand out in a giveaway. So we're going to be doing that today. And that's just wanted to say if you guys haven't been out to the library lately, come on back. So, and I'm going to pass it over to Julia. Can you 
guys hear me? Yes. yes. Okay. I just felt uncomfortable with two mics. How are you guys doing this afternoon or evening? Great. Great. Are you excited to be here? Yes. yes. That really wasn't great. Are you excited to be here? Yes. Thank you. Welcome to One Book, One City. I am so excited to see you guys. I'm glad we're out here again. We're a little cooler weather this time. It's great. I just want to talk to you. If I haven't seen, have all of you been to the bookstore? Yes. yes. Okay. Well, I know a lot of you are on this side. So, I'm Julia. I took over the bookstore in November 2020. Um, it's great to be a part of the Powder Springs community. I'm hoping that we can continue to grow and do amazing things. We do have a lot of things going on at the bookstore. Of course, we have book club. Um, we have stuffy sleepovers for our little ones. We have date nights for the for the adults. Um, coming up, we will have Independent Bookstore Day, which is April 29th. And then again, we'll have an event for our kids on April 30th. One of the biggest things going on right now at the Bookworm is we are a drop-off spot for Aaliyah's sixth annual book drive. Aaliyah was a resident of the Powder Springs community, and unfortunately I have to say was because she recently passed away in January in a car accident. She was 19, she was a member of the Powder Springs Community Task Force, the Youth Division, and literacy was a big part of who she was. Um, she wanted to always give back. If you guys have been in Powder Springs for a while, you know that there's a back to school batch where they collect supplies as well as they give out books. We are a drop off spot for that. So I hope to see all of you. I want you to spread your word. We are there. Drop off is happening from now until July 27th. And that is new books, that is used books, like new, whatever that looks like. I want to say from K to 12th grade. I want to see you guys over there. When you guys are doing your used books for your trade ins, consider dropping them in the box versus getting trade in credit. Um, we are a strong community. I know we can fill that box up several times over, so I just wanted to make sure that you guys, if you have not seen my post or have not been to the store in the last two days, that is happening. So enough of that. Are you guys ready for me to introduce Mr. Quick? Yes! Okay. We're going to work on this. <laughs> Mr. Quick, Matthew Quick, came. He doesn't live here, so he came all the way over here to see us in this amazing book, and I cannot wait to sit down and talk to him. So, can we bring Matthew Quick to the stage? It's a great Powder Springs welcome, because I know you're all excited. And are you guys ready? Yeah. How you doing? I'm doing all right. It's good to be here, Julia. Thank you. Or? I want to say it's beautiful to be here. I thank you for coming out on this gorgeous evening. It's a pleasure to be in your community tonight. I'm looking forward to talking with all of you. All right. Have a right. sir. Thank you very much. So I'm going to tell you guys, I had the honor of getting, as a bookstore owner, we get advanced copies of books. Um, I had the honor of reading Mr. Quick's book prior to it coming out. And I was like, oh my goodness, I need to We need to get him here. Um, <laughs> I had the opportunity to interview him for a short time, and it just wasn't enough. Um, not only because of the book, but because of the personality, um, because of the energy. So I wanted to talk to him about We Are the Light. Um, we know all of his accolades, but I want to give us in your words, We Are the Light. I know we can all read the blurb. I know we can see what other people are saying, but what, what is We Are The Light to you? Well, I think the, the simplest way to say it is it's, it's a book about radical love. Um, it's a book about coming together in our darkest times and choosing unity rather than division. Um, I think it's a book about people caring about their neighbors. It's a book about people putting people over politics or ideas. And I think, um, you know, for me, it was, it was something that um, 
you know, as the world kind of got more and more divisive, it's something I've been thinking about a lot. You know, how, how do we bring people together in, in these times when it seems like everybody's fighting all the time and every time we have these big headline things that happen in the news, it just kind of rips our communities apart. And so I thought to myself, how, how could we bring people back to a place of love um, and radical love? And I say radical love because I think sometimes um, in these days we kind of roll, there are people that roll their eyes at, at the concept of love. And um, you know, I think we've had a lot of talks over the last couple of years about power. And you know, those are really, really important conversations. Like we need to have talks about power. But I think the thing that I've been worried about in the last couple of years is we kind of raise up these talks of power, we kind of relegate talks of love. And I think um, you know, we really need both. You know, I, I think the reason why we want to talk about power is so that we can create communities where we can love each other. You know, what's the use of having power if there's no love in our community? So I think, you know, over and over as I've been talking about this book for the last year, it always comes back to that concept of, of, of love and, you know, this idea of radical love. Love it. One of the things I noticed between the arc, um, which an arc, again, advanced reader copy. So the advanced reader copy is right before editing, final edits, um, and before it goes out to you guys. One of the things I noticed is in the arc, there was a letter to the reader. Um, that wasn't in the final copy. The letter to the reader was so powerful to me. It was in the beginning of the book. Um, is there a reason that wasn't included? Well, Your decision. it definitely wasn't my decision. <laughs> um, so what happened uh, when they were putting together the ARCs, the advanced reading copy, my editor, Joe Ferrari Adler, came uh, and he asked me if I'd write the letter because when he read the book and when it was on submission, he read it in one night and he wanted to buy it the next day. And um, he wanted us to take it out, you know, off submission so he could have it. So we had a lot of conversations. And we had talked a lot about the origin story, you know, where did this come from? Why did I write it? And so I, I told him a little bit about my story. And so he asked me to, to write uh, a letter explaining that as succinctly as possible, which was tough because it, it had to be a certain word length. And then he wanted to include that. And so we did. And then when we published the book, he wanted to pitch that letter as an essay. It was published in Lit Hub. So you can actually read it online. Uh, you can find, if you just Google Matthew Quick Lit Hub, you'll, you'll find it right away in, in the form of an essay. It's not a letter. We just kind of tweaked it. So that, that's why um, it got taken out. Well, I'm glad it's around. I encourage you guys to, to read it. Um, it is a very personal letter. Um, you can tell that Matthew is passionate about not only what he does, but just spreading love and joy through the world. So I do encourage you guys to, to take it and read that. Um, let's talk about the main character a little bit. Um, well, not the main character, well, Carl. Carl is Lucas's young, how do you pronounce that? Youngian? Youngian, youngian analyst. analyst. What's a Youngian analyst? And tell us, Tell us a little bit about that for those who are not aware of what that is. Sure. So um, a Jungian analyst is somebody who is a therapist but uses the framework of Carl Jung, the psychologist, as that framework. And so um, I could talk probably for 10 hours about Jung's philosophy, but just in a nutshell, the difference between uh, you know, modern traditional therapy and being in Jungian analysis, which I, I'm still into this day, is that Jung had this idea that the purpose of analysis wasn't necessarily to make you feel better, but to figure out who you were meant to be when you came into this world. And so um, he calls this individuation. And so the purpose is to be to sit down with your analyst and try to figure out um, what your body is telling you. So, for example, you know, I'm somebody who suffered from anxiety and depression. And so instead of saying, you know, let's make that anxiety and depression go away with a med or, you know, with, you know, a certain type of thinking, let's sit with that and try to figure out what it's telling you, 
you know, where, where are you, where are you going wrong? You know, what, what is, what does your body want you to do? What does your psyche want you to do? So it's really more of a deep dive into who you are. And so to put this in context, I entered into Jungian analysis thinking I was going for curing writer's block. And I had done some research and I've been listening to this podcast, This Jungian Life, when I entered into analysis and I found um, an analyst that I, I thought was a good match for me. And when I sat down with him, I told him, you know, I'm here to, to figure out my writer's block. You know, how long is this going to take? You know, maybe one or two months. And he said, oh, that's really interesting that you think you would be able to do this in one or two months. And I said, well, why? How long did it take you? Because I knew he had been in analysis. And he said, uh, it, it took me about 20 years, maybe, you know? And so so it's, a, it's a big commitment. Um, it's not a fast easy thing. It's something that you you go into studying yourself and trying to figure out, you know, what makes you tick and what are you supposed to be doing in this world. And so I, I entered into it um, after getting sober. I got sober about five years ago and I immediately got writer's block and my life kind of got very small. I hold up the pandemic didn't help. Um, and so I, I think that for me, um, I thought I had a very strong sense of who I was, but I was also alcohol dependent, um, like, like many writers, unfortunately. And when I stopped drinking, I started asking all these questions about, well, who am I if I'm not drinking anymore? And when I stopped drinking, all these feelings that I've been numbing for 20 years started to come up. What are those feelings about? What are they coming, where are they coming from? And it was, it was a very overwhelming process for me that I'm still going through to this day. And so that really kind of laid the, the groundwork for writing this book because when I first started analysis, I was terrified that my analyst was going to disappear because I was working with an older man um, who quickly became very much a father figure to me. And I didn't know how much I needed that, how, much, how healthy that was for me. And so there was this dark part inside of me that thought, I need this so much. I need this father figure that's going to show up once or twice a week for me. I've never had this before. Surely it'll be taken away from me. Like that was the paranoid thought. Like he can't be real. And so when I started thinking about that, um, I drug it into the creative writing wrestling ring, which is what I do with all kind of my mental health problems. And I started thinking about, well, what if I explored this idea of an analyst, you know, someone very dependent on the analyst and having that taken away from them, what would the protagonist do? You know, so that kind of led me into the writing of this book. You, you talk about, not only in the book, um, in, in your letters, um, your struggle with mental illness, anxiety, depression, we as a culture always put such a stigma um, on one getting help um, and someone who sees differently or thinks differently and has these things. How do you, how important was it to translate that into, into your work? Because I know writing is a form of therapy not only for you but for your reader as well. How important was it to, to bring that to the forefront to hopefully open up discussions about mental illness and, and how do we how do we help others? Well, I think it's, it's really important. Um, I think all of my work, all of my nine books are, are me trying to figure out, you know, me, you know, my stuff. Um, and I've been literally all over the world talking about these things and everywhere I go, whether it's the Philippines or Scotland or Brazil or anywhere in the U.S., there are people that come up to me and say, you know, me too. Like, these are the things that are have going on with me and it feels really healthy to see my experiences reflected back to me from on the page to let people know that they're not alone. You know, I, when I wrote the Silver Linux Playbook, I had quit a tenured position at a, as a high school teacher at a really good school and I was living with my in-laws in Massachusetts and working in their unfinished basement and people thought I had lost my mind. So my father very famously um, screamed at me and told me I was an idiot and like this is the, the most awful thing I could ever do and I was really lonely and I was depressed and I was feeling a lot of anxiety and I wrote this book about this you know character who goes home to live in Philly and you know kind of battled out with his dad and has this kind of breakdown and I, I thought it was 
this fictional thing that I had created. And then when I found a publisher for it, which shocked me because I, I, I had no idea that there would be a market for this. And then we did the movie deal, it became this really terrifying thing for me because I thought, uh oh, now everybody's going to read this. You know, and I started thinking, what did I write? And you know, my parents are going to read this. And, and the six months before I published Silver Linings Playbook, I, it was just one nonstop anxiety attack for me. I was, it was probably the worst six months of my life. And when the book came out, a lot of my friends in, in the Philadelphia area who were kids like me that had grown up, they weren't kids anymore, they were in their 30s at the time, but we had grown up in blue collar neighborhoods with gruff fathers that didn't talk about emotions and uh, the, the two most important men in my life were my grandfather was a World War II vet and my Uncle Pete who was a Vietnam vet. Neither of them, they were very conservative men who did not talk about emotions, were very old school and I, I was terrified of, of kind of being found out. Um, but a lot of my friends, you know, guys I went to the Eagles game with, they, they read the book and they kind of very quietly came up to me on the sly and said, you know, how do you know about this stuff? Because me too. Like, you know, and some of them said, I've been in therapy for a year and I haven't told anybody. I know one of my friends had gone through an ordeal where he was diagnosed with schizophrenia and we had never talked about it ever. Like, I knew that he had a break we just never talked about that. And I was on a, a, a train ride into Philadelphia going to the Eagles game. And we had that conversation because you read my book. You know, so not only was it, you know, an act of, I don't want to say bravery, but, you know, like it, it helped me to process these things when I, when I read about my mental health. But it opens up conversation for people in my life. And I routinely get letters from people, particularly teenagers who've read some of my YA stuff, um, in particular, forgive me, Leonard Peacock, where kids will say, that just reading this book and seeing that I'm not alone literally saved my life. Um, you know, and I saw that time and time again when I was a high school teacher, how literature could, could save these kids, or just having a conversation, like letting the kids know that they weren't alone could, could save them and get them through the day. And so, you know, by, by being brave and exploring these things on the page, like obviously, you know, that's how I make my living now. But when I started, it was just me trying to get relief from all of these things, me trying to figure out who I was. And, um, you know, there was cer a certain alchemy, there was a certain magic that happened where this path emerged and people, sh you know, they showed up and they said, I think this is valuable, I think there's a market for this. And, and, Things just kind of came about, so I don't I don't know that I planned it that way, and um, I definitely when I started out didn't want to be the mental health guy, but it's what I feel called to write about, and when I try to write about other things, it, it usually doesn't go well. So I don't think you know there's some writers who, who say you get to pick what you write, but I really don't. I think most of the people that I know, the writers I know, you just have a certain dharma. You have you have you have things to say. You, you, you have um, been gifted opportunities to write about certain things. And I think if you follow that trajectory, that's usually, uh, I don't want to say that's the path to success, it's more a path to figuring out who you are and being authentic. And I think when you're who you are and you're authentic, sometimes the right people show up. Yeah. And I think it's, let's give them a round of applause. Yeah. 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 Thank you. I can't, I can't even go past that right here. Um, <laughs> Because it is, it, it is very important. I know from a bookstore standpoint, when we became sensory inclusive certified and people who have been coming in for the first year and a half finally opened up and said, thank you, um, I, I, this is me. Um, whereas before they were coming in and it was like they couldn't feel like they could speak about it. So it's important for you to keep writing these books. Um, it's therapeutic, I'm sure, not for just you, but for us that are reading as well. So keep doing what you're doing. Thank you. I will. I appreciate that. That's why I came just to hear that. I, <laughs> I needed that today. Thank you. What you doing? Um, which, again, I see that in Lucas, which is the main character. And I'm going to try not to do any spoilers, of course. Um, Lucas, the main character, is, is very vulnerable. Um, He's dealing with a lot. Um, he's dealing with personal issues. He's dealing with the weight and the struggle um, of how the town is perceiving him. 
did you find any of yourself in Lucas? Was it important for you to make not only Lucas vulnerable, but a male character vulnerable? Because um, that's not something that we see a lot. Yeah, I, I think so. You know, um, y you know, I'll try to do this without spoilers too, but one, one of the things that happens to Lucas is he emerges from this, this tragedy, you know, early in the book, and the town declares him a hero, which you would think that that, you know, that would be a lovely thing to be declared a hero, but because of the way things went down and the loss and the complicated feelings that Lucas has, he's not able to function. You know, he can barely leave his house at this point, and, and he cannot play the role of hero. Um, but that's, that's put upon him, you know, it's put upon him, and he has to figure this out. And the way that he figures out how to be a hero is by mentoring this young boy, Eli, um, which is this, this beautiful thing that is, again, thrust upon him. You know, he'd been counseling this, this young man in high school before the tragedy, and then he just sets up a tent in his backyard, and you know, Lucas is enough to deal with. You know, he's he's lost his wife. He's he's dealing with PTSD, and then here's this young boy that needs something from him, and uh, he has to find a way to rise up and to be a hero for this young person, which is different than being a hero from the t for the town. And you know, for me in my personal life, um, you know, I lived through a lot of. You know, small t trauma growing up. You know, a lot of um, you know the after effects of war in my family. My my father had to deal with that growing up. He didn't get a very good playbook from his father. Uh, you know, it was it was it was a rough time in my house. And you know, I was kind of tapped as a young man by my grandfather to be what he called the glue. You know, you got to keep everybody together. You know, you got to take care of. It. He wanted me to be a preacher. My grandfather, he kind of tapped me for that. And, you know, when I started teaching, um, I also fell into this very caretaking role where I was taking care of a lot of young people and I became this kind of de facto therapist. And, but I was 25, you know, and I hadn't been trained. And I worked in a very affluent neighborhood with kids that were trying to get into Harvard, but they all were addicted to drugs and they all were having pregnancy scares and they all. Uh, we're driving drunk every weekend, and they, it was this town where everything looked perfect, but if you just squinted just even a little bit, you saw how, how everything was in chaos. And these kids were all on the edge, and they were all hurting. But because they had the right SAT score, and because they had the right clothes on, and the right you know look, everybody was, let's just not look too hard. And so, you know, for me, I, I've always, I don't know if it's because of my upbringing, but I tend to gravitate in a community towards, you know, the, the people that are hurting, you know, and that's, that's a difficult thing to do because in order to help the people that are hurting, we have to admit that our communities aren't perfect. Okay. And that is, that is difficult and that takes some heroics and you don't always get thanks for that. You know, you don't, that's not always a fun role to play. And so, you know, Lucas in this, in this novel, he, he doesn't want to be the hero. You know, he, he doesn't even necessarily want to be father figure either, but he's tasked with trying to figure this out. Um, and I think there are some of us that, that see things. There are some of us that are called to speak up. There are some of us who just can't let things go because that's just not who we are. And I think my characters are, are, are like that. And, and sometimes, um, you know, I, I've been like that too sometimes in the past. And, you know, there's many a times when I say, I just want to stay in my house and not get involved anymore, you know, and I'll stop writing books, but then you feel the voice and something comes up and you feel like you have to, you got to say something, you got to do something, you know, you got to get involved, and that's, that's kind of the friction of life, you know, it's the friction of fiction, but I think we respond to that because there's something in us that wants better, not only for us, but for our communities, for our family, for people, and that voice is something that I think society wants to crush out of us. But I think the best of us is trying to hold on to that voice. And that's what I try to find in, in the art that I make. And that's what I try to find when I come out to these communities and try to partner up with people, people like Julia here. You know, the good people are out there, um, but it's work to, to get them together, you know. Um, so, yeah. <laughs> I know. Can I not tell you this was going to 
be good, right? Um, the focus, let's, let's talk about the tragedy. Um, and I'm not giving anything away. It is a gun violence tragedy. And I know when I first read the arc, um, it was around a school shooting time. Here we are again, I'm rereading, and we're again around a school shooting time. Um, gun violence, what made you choose gun violence as the tragedy? Um, and the, the book is not fully focused on the tragedy, but knowing that that is definitely a, a hot topic, a topic we, we as a country need to deal with, what made you choose that part as the tragedy? Because you could have chose all kinds of tragedies. Yeah, so um, you know, I didn't want to write a book about gun violence. It's not something I wanted to do. And um, I would say the book isn't really about gun violence. It's, it's the violence happens off screen and before the book even starts. But I've always been somebody who loves to go to the movies ever since I was a kid. It was one of the few things my father and I did as a child that I actually liked doing with my dad. And my grandfather used to take me to the movies a lot. And, my wife, uh, Alicia and I, our first date was to the movies in Philly, you know, when she was 17, I was 19. We saw this movie, The Three Musketeers with Kiefer Southern. It was, it was not a good movie, but there was some hand holding during the movie and some kissing on the cobblestone streets of Philadelphia, Old City, and, and we fell in love. And my wife and I um, went to the movies religiously, especially in our 20s. And I mean that in two ways. We went every week, but we also went um, looking for something, looking for a sense of transcendence. You know, a great film when you sit down in a movie house and you see the screen that's larger than life and it takes you on this journey, it takes you out of your life. And, and in some ways it can really inspire us to um, be better than we are. You know, it can be almost a religious experience to go to the movies, a good movie, when you see a really great film. And we were also these young kids who wanted to be storytellers. And so we went to the movies every week trying to learn how to tell stories. We studied the movies, you know, and it was where we learned craft. And so when the shooting in Aurora, Colorado happened at the movie theater, it hit me particularly hard. Um, you know, any shooting anywhere hits me hard. I mean, it, we shouldn't even have to say that, but, you know, it's, it's, it's ridiculous that it keeps happening. But when Columbine happened, I had been a teacher for years, but I never once thought, oh, I won't go into a school again. Or I never thought, like, I'll be afraid to go into a school. I, I don't know why. It just didn't affect me in that way. Uh, but when Aurora, Colorado happened, the next time I went to the movies, it was kind of looking over my shoulder and um, checking the exits. And I was like, who is in this theater with me? Um, and that was not, uh, you know, a fun experience, you know, but it was also, I, I found myself a little angry about it too. Like this place that I went that felt safe to me ever since I was a child had been sullied. You know, and there was a part of me that wanted to reclaim that space and, and make it safe again. Um, and, and so the writing of the book, I, I did a one book, one uh, town in Amber, Pennsylvania. If you look at the cover of the book, the movie theater is the Amber Theater. It's a real place. It's a historic theater. And that night, I walked into that theater, and it was a packed house, and I had this great evening with everybody. And afterwards, I went out for drinks with the librarians across the street. And I came out, and I'm looking at the marquee. It's all lit up, and it's this like cathedral-like building, very beautiful. I think it's built in the 20s. And I said to myself, there's this, this voice that said, you have to write a novel about a movie house where there's a tragedy and the hero, the, the, the protagonist comes out and he, he has to re-sanctify the space and bring his community together. So that was the first piece of the puzzle. And I, I tried to write that book for seven years and I kept failing and failing and failing. I couldn't get it right. I couldn't get the tone right. But the other thing that I noticed that was happening, and, and I, I get this, you know, I'm, I'm not even against this, but whenever there's a shooting, immediately it's just everybody erupts into politics. Mm -hmm. And I get that politics are, are super important and these things have consequences, but I notice everybody just fractures to different sides. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I know if I call one person, they're going to say the same thing as everybody else on that side. If I call another person, they're going to say the same thing as everyone else on that side. And what it just does is just keeps driving people further and further apart. And I don't see the arguments ever kind of going to a place where people are 
are coming together and trying to solve something. And so what I wanted to do with this book was to bring people back to story and use story as medicine. And this is a very Jungian thing as well. Um, and I didn't want it to be about politics. I didn't want it to, not, not that, that politics aren't important, but I want it to be about people putting that argument aside and coming together and loving themselves through this tragedy. And as someone who you know, considers himself a member of the mental health committee, who sometimes goes into a depression, sometimes has severe anxiety, there are times when people will try to hit me with political talk when I'm in that mode where I'm just trying to get through the day. You know, I can't, I can't go to those places and, and sit and listen to somebody rant at me about something. Um, and it's not that I'm not interested in that, but I think sometimes when we get so political that we forget to be human, we kind of lose sight of, of what we're doing. You know, I'm, I'm not somebody who has a passionate side on this. You know, when I, when I see a tragedy happen, my heart goes out to those community members. And sometimes I think when I see people go into that hating other people or yelling or screaming or, you know, just getting angry or using it for political points, I think, I wonder sometimes now, I become fearful, is, is this why we have so many violent people in our community? Like, why do people want so many guns? You know, is it because we're, we're, we're in this place where we're just not talking to each other anymore? And I know that, um, I, I, I talk to a, a wide spectrum of people, you know, all over the board. You know, the people I work with are extremely liberal. Some of my friends and family members are cons extremely conservative. And the funny thing that I, I, I always see is that when I talk to these people, oftentimes they're saying the exact same things, you know, just from a different point of view. And they remind me so much of each other, especially when you get to the extremes. You know, it's, it's almost, and so my theory is, you know, that we need to bring people back to a place of commonality, a place of being human. And so that's what I really wanted to do with this book, you know, to show how art and story can sometimes bring us back into that, that good place where we're in union together. And maybe sometimes we can put politics aside just, just to focus on, on healing. Again, not that politics isn't important. I get that all of those things are important. But I think we need to have some places that are apolitical where we can come together and at least love each other for short periods of time before we start fighting again. You know, I think that is really important and that's really what I wanted to focus on with this book. Um, and I think you did that. I think that's one of the things that you just said that that was so powerful and where we, I think, as a culture need to get past is stop picking sides. Like, at the end of the day, we got to come together. We're all in this together. So the fact that we keep picking sides is, is you're completely right is where we keep messing up at. Um, so I think your book, of course, makes us have tough conversations, makes us think in these sections. So uh, I find that really important. So let's give another round of applause. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Um, which brings me to one of my next questions because words are powerful. Um, and you definitely, um, when writing this, put thought into how do I bring the world together? Um, and on page 164, and this is talking about um, part of the, the tragedy and, and the remake and the gunshot um, and putting that into what they're doing. And you wrote in here, um, I had argued in favor of keeping the pivotal scene. And one of the most important lines to me in this book is, how can we transcend something we won't even face in fiction? Medicine tastes bad, I said, but it heals. So a lot of us go to, to reading fiction to get away. Um, sometimes we go to get away, sometimes we go for help. So you're right, if we can't face that in, in a non-realistic world, how do we face that in a world? How, did you realize when you were writing that line and it was so powerful is that your intent <laughs> Just me? <laughs> well, you know, I, I think sometimes you, you, you're writing and you're in the character, you know, and you're just trying to let the character, I write in first person, so I'm just trying to let the character speak. And 
So in the moment, um, I don't think I sat there and said, oh, wow, <laughs> that was great, good on me. Um, but I think that was a really important line in the book. And I know my editor, Jofi, you know, would point to that line. And I remember, you know, they do editing. And I remember he did a little star and a smiley face next to that line, actually, uh, which is kind of funny. You think, you know, if you're working with these sophisticated New York editors, you're getting a smiley face, right? And you know, just like in third grade. Um, but, you know, I, I, I think for me, um, especially as a, as a teacher, you know, a former teacher was always trying to get my students to, to face the hard thing, you know, to look at things that they didn't want to look at. And I think it was David Foster Wallace. I heard him say this. I don't think this is his quote, but uh, he said that when he's writing, um, he tries to comfort the disturbed and disturb the comforted, you know, and I, and I think that that's, that's something that um, you're always kind of balancing. Because the best way to sell books is just to write a book that narcissistically reflects what the reader already believes in. And that's what politicians do, too. They, they, they feed you what you already believe, and they don't challenge you, so you feel good. And so I think for me, I've always enjoyed reading things that, that challenge me. You know, like I remember you know, being 20 and reading Ralph Ellison's Invisible Man and being like, wow, this is, this is different. Like, this is very challenging. Like, this is things that I didn't know about before um, that made me uncomfortable, but it was brilliant and interesting. And, you know, to step into someone else's point of view, like, that, that lights me up. Like, I, I like that a lot. Like, and I, but I think that life is hard, you know? And I think, you know, I remember my dad telling me when I was a teenager, he only wanted to see movies with happy endings because his life is tough enough. And I get that point of view. And so I'm always constantly trying to put this worldview out there that I think is going to help and be medicinal while trying to tell a good story that people are going to enjoy as well and try to walk that line, um, which is is difficult, you know, and it's it's always that balance of, of um, trying to put good into the world but also pay the bills and you know there's always and it gets even trickier when you start writing screenplays for hollywood because they want you to do the thing that's just going to make everybody feel good and, and buy the ticket and so it's it's always that kind of compromise but i think in this this too i think you know i was doing a lot of work in analysis and analysis the Jungian analysis one of the things we work on is getting in touch with shadow and so shadow in Jungian analysis is looking at all the things that we don't want to see about ourselves. And so usually what we do when we don't want to see them is that we project them onto other people and attack. You know, so uh, you know, why is that person so angry? I'm so mad that that person is so angry. It's not me that's angry, it's that person, you know, that kind of thing. And so looking in and, and trying to figure out what are the things that I don't want to see about myself. And that is not a fun process. It's not because you have to see a lot of things that you don't want to see. But the more you make peace with those things that you don't want to see, the easier it is to tolerate them in other people. And I think the more that we look at the things that we're afraid of in society and make peace with them, the more that it's easier to engage with a wide variety of people. We don't have to be so afraid anymore. But doing that work is work. You know, it's tough. And, you know, I really put Lucas through the ringer in this book. He has to do a lot of work in this book, you know, and I keep throwing things at him. But I, I think that that's, that's life. And I've had to do a lot of work since getting sober five years ago to try to figure out who I am as well so I could tell these stories. Uh, I'm going to keep coming back to this. I get round of applause every time. It's amazing. I would like to ask you. you with the questions, though, right? It's all the questions. Yeah, thanks. Thank you, Max. It's all they, they didn't catch that. Thing. Give her a round of applause. Come on. <laughs> um, religion plays a part in the book. Not a big part, but it does play a part. Um, I'm a very spiritual person. So, Darcy, um, and again, no spoilers here, because we know that uh, Lucas's wife passed away um, through the yeah. tragedy. So, Darcy comes to visit in the form of an angel. Um, not only did you say in the form of an angel, but you were very descriptive um, from when they were, sometimes when he felt like she was holding him or he was holding her, and there were feathers. Um, 
it was so angelic, so real um, to me. I, again, was that intentional? Is that how did you put yourself in that space to, to write that? Well, um, you know, there's a couple different answers to this. You know, I grew up in a very religious household, so like I, I, I was taught about angels as a child. You know, read the Bible, all of that. So. There's that, you know, that's in my DNA, and you know, that's just where I come from. But also, you know, studying psychology, and Lucas had goes through this incredibly damaging experience that I, I, I don't think anybody, you know, would go through and be unaffected by. And his psyche or his soul kind of fractures. And the interesting thing, you know, particularly in the Jungian work that I do, is that you learn when you go through trauma, your psyche will do things to keep you from fully exploding or fully falling apart. And so one of the things that Lucas's psyche does is it, he's not ready to say goodbye to his wife, so he starts to see her as an angel. And these are very real visitations. And so um, I, I play with this idea of the feathers because like, are the feathers coming from her? Are the feathers coming from the pillow on the bed? You know, like. And I think that the important thing is, is that Lucas needs a story to get him through this awful period. And so he has this idea of his wife coming to him as an angel. And so many people ask me, you know, is it real? Is there an angel? You know, is there not an angel? Is it sent from God? I think the point is that Lucas needs this. And the people in his community don't say to him, like, oh, no, no, there's no such thing as that. They, they hold this the story that he's telling very gently, and it becomes almost this womb that allows him to kind of reform and kind of get through this, this dark period in his life. And I think, you know, as a storyteller and as someone who has, has done a lot of thinking about um, psychology over the past five years, you know, we are all telling ourselves stories to get through the day. And some of those stories are healthier than other stories. And I think one of the things that in this modern world that we live in, we're so obsessed with what is real, what is not real. Is religion real? Is it not real? Is our stories real? Are they not real? And the thing that I've come to believe is, is that our sense of real is very altered by our mo modern sensibilities. You know, 200 years ago, no one would ask that question of like, what's real, what's not real? And I think sometimes, um, uh, I, I worry that we've, we've traded, you know, um, this modern sensibility of, 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 of reality for like these things that we had, these stories, whether it comes from religion or, you know, the, the stories that we've, we've grown up with, you know, dismissing story as, as something less than real, I think is, is a big mistake. And I think there's a reason why we keep going to story, why we go to the movies, why we, why we go to church why we go to the, the synagogue or the mosque, um, because we're looking for something that helps us understand what it means to be a human being. And that's a very complicated thing that is not one plus one equals two. You know, and I think in the Jungian work that I do, we're constantly talking about symbols to hold information that's, that's, that's not simple. So the, the, this concept of an angel for, for Lucas is very, very complicated. And so a Jungian would say, you know, what does that symbolize, symbol, symbolize for him? And what, what, is, what is he holding through that symbol? And there's a, lot of, there's a lot to be gleaned from that. I think a modern person would say, I don't believe in angels. They're not real. End of story. And then you just write off Lucas. But Lucas is trying to tell you something with that story. His psyche is trying to tell us something with that story. And symbols and stories are powerful. You know, and what we choose to to believe in, or what we choose to to hold sacred, um, can be life saving. You know, it's it's really important, and I think we, as we kind of move into this modern era, you know, we, we dismiss the power of stories. I think much much to our own detriment. Um, Ethel Wright, who is and I know that she wrote, I think his name is, let me see, Eugene Monick. Um, you mentioned a couple of books written by him. I know for me as a reader, whenever I see, and I don't know if I'm only one, whenever I see a book or an author mentioned, I'm putting the book down and I'm Googling. Um, 
Googling to see if it's a real book, um, did you guys make it up? And it's a lot of times it's a little of both. Um, clearly, I can move in those are real books. Are those books that you use to study the art of young men? Um, do you, when you write, do you like to use real works, or do you prefer to use made up stories? I. I, I like to dip into real things. I like to put things that are real in, into the books. Um, you know, with with the Eugene Monic stuff, one of the things that my analyst did uh, very early on with me is try to work on this sense of healthy masculinity with me. Um, you know, and we, we hear a lot about toxic masculinity these days, and you know, believe me, I understand there's a lot of toxic masculinity out there. I, I, as someone who worked with Harvey Weinstein, I know that there's a lot of toxic masculinity out there. And you know, toxic masculinity doesn't just hurt women, it hurts men too. You know, um, when my grandfather was destroyed by World War II, my uncle was destroyed by, by Vietnam, and they, they just made a lot of toxic masculinity around me, and I was a very sensitive young man at the time. That, that didn't do me any favors growing up. But one of the things that I, I get sad about, particularly, and I worry about this for young men, is that we, we hear the words toxic masculinity over and over and over again. But what we don't hear in the media are the words positive masculinity. And, you know, I think young men are being told over and over again about how toxic they are. They're being demonized, but we're not telling young men what they should be. You know, what's beautiful about masculinity. And so some of the, the young in books, you know, Eugene Monarch work writes about this a lot, is, is reclaiming, you know, the, the sacred masculine, you know, this idea of, of um, the idea of the good king, you know, we all know what the toxic king looks like, you know, we just turn on the news, we see it all the time, but I think we've forgotten that there, there is the good king as well, and there's, there, there's a, a, a masculinity that can, that can go out into the community and generate things that are positive for everybody. And so for me, growing up with people who had been damaged by war and a father who had been raised by an abusive, broken war vet, I didn't have that sense of positiveness. I didn't have a, a, a positive father figure. I didn't, I didn't have these things growing up. And so that was something that I've been trying to work on to this day with my analyst, who's become very much a father figure to me. And you know, he told me, very early on, if, if you hate yourself, if you hate your masculinity, you're never going to feel well. Like you've got to make peace with that. And he also said, you have to start making peace with your father. And you know, um, and in early analysis, I was always constantly talking about all the things my father didn't do. You know, he's always yelling at me. You know, he he he's always exploding. He did, and my analyst would just push back on that. And he said, did he feed you? And I said, yeah. He said, did he give you clothes? Did he give you shelter? Yeah. He said, that's not nothing. You know, like that's, that's love. You know, that's something. You know, that, that's what he could give you. And until you, you learn to appreciate the positive things about your father, you're never going to be able to appreciate the positive things about yourself. Um, and so it was this journey, you know, and, and, and it's very much reflective of Lucas. You know, he's this person that, is also broken at this complicated relationship with uh, his father and his, his mother. But he has this beautiful relationship with his friend Isaiah. You know, his friend Isaiah will hug him. You know, his friend Isaiah will tell him that he, he loves him in a very masculine way. And because Isaiah is there for Lucas, Lucas is able to be there for Eli. You know, and in the book you have um, two brothers, you know, Eli and Jacob. And Eli is a a kid that shoots a movie, he makes art, you know, he shoots a movie. Jacob is a kid that shoots people, you know, and I posit in the book, what is the difference between those, those two boys that were, had the same upbringing? Well, there were men in the community that took an interest in one of them, and there was another brother that didn't have that luxury. That's not an excuse that doesn't, you know, forgive what he does in the book, but I do think that as somebody who experienced a tremendous amount of father hunger growing up, you know, it's a Robert Bly term, you know, I know how hungry young men are for, for that father figure in their life. You know, that, that's a big deal. And I think today we kind of dismiss that sometimes very lightly, as if, you know, we don't need masculinity anymore, or everybody that's masculine is somehow um, toxic, or we should just throw them away. And I, 
I think that that couldn't be further from the truth, and I think that's why we have a lot of hurt young men. And as I've gone across the country and talked about these things, in every community I look out, there's always a young man, you know, usually around 20 and 21, looking and just locked in, you know, just so hungry. Uh, I had one funny experience in, uh, at the Austin, Texas Book Festival. There were two young men in their early 20s, and uh, they were filming the, the event. They were behind two cameras, the two there, and they kept looking at each other and laughing. They were an event. At first, I thought they were laughing at me. Like they, they didn't like what I was saying, and, and I was uncomfortable. But after I finished speaking, they made a beeline for me. And um, they came up to me, and they said, we don't know who you were. We had never read your books before. But you know, we were hired to do this, but we're both recently sober. And everything you're saying about masculinity is like what we talk about in our groups. Like we're so hungry for this. And then they said this thing to me that just about killed me. They said, "We're so glad that members of the elder generation are giving back to the youth." I said, "Oh man, I'll preach that part. I'm in the elder generation." And they, they, had this, they were so sincere that they, they, they thought they were giving me the greatest compliment ever. I never felt so old in my life. But the point of the story is that these young men were just hungry. I, I was just talking to a group of people for an hour. I, was, I didn't come there to feed them, but they were fed that day. You know, and, and so, in my opinion, I was just given scraps that day. And they were so hungry that they had to thank you for these scraps. You know, they, they just had such father hunger that they're just looking for any older man to validate where they are and tell them that they're okay and that we'll accept them as they are, and that they can be something more than what society is telling them that they can be. So, you know, I think that that's, that, that's an, a very important part of um, what the book has to say. And I, I kind of stumbled into that through the analysis of my analysts really pushing back on these, these own kind of assumptions and, you know, these toxic parts of me that were hating myself because I thought, well, I come from these men that are toxic, so therefore I must be toxic too. And I think we have, to, we have to guard against that. As we clean up toxic masculinity, we don't make people feel toxic. And I think that's, that's an important distinction. Thank you. Um, you wrote the book in the form of letters. Um, versus traditional novel. Um, what I mean, and I'm gonna get because I I can tell letters are important to you um, based on uh, your monthly letters, which we'll get into. Um, what made you choose that journey? I know for me, growing up, that's actually how I communicated when I was getting in trouble or um, when it didn't know how to tell my mother something. Um, she would tell me, go write in a letter, put it on my pillow, I'll read it later. Um, that's great. <laughs> I'll read it later. Um, so it's a way for me to express myself. So that's probably one of the reasons I still journal to this day. I'm still writing is important. So um, I love the fact that it was in the form of a letter or multiple letters. Was, is that something you enjoy writing that way? Or what did you think that? I love writing letters, and I, I, I was always a letter writer myself. I had pen pals as young as, um, I think it was 14 when I got my first pen pal. It was actually in OBX. I met a, a young woman from Stafford, Virginia, and we met on the beach, and I said, let's write. And we, we actually did write for about you know, the next five or six years. And I've always had pen pals. Um, you know, I had a, a friend of mine that I met on a trip to Peru that I wrote for 20 years every day. We wrote letters back and forth. He was, he was an older man, a bit of a father figure to me as well. Um, so I've always loved writing letters. I wrote The Good Book, uh, the good Luck of Right Now as an epistolary novel and letters. And I thought that was the book I wrote in letters. That was the one I was going to do. But then when I got sober, I got writer's block. And I, I just couldn't write anything for years. I would sit down every single day and try to write for eight hours and struggle to write a sentence. And at the end of the year, I'd have 10 pages, and I would show them to my wife, who's my first reader. She's also a novelist, and she would literally cry because they were so bad, and she was so afraid. And so Lisa started saying to me, um, you know, you can't write, but you write these beautiful letters to your friends. You know, you have pen pals, and you write emails, and so why don't you write another book in letters? And I said to her, I, I can't do that. I've already done it one time. Not everybody likes epistolary novels. Some people find them gimmicky. I don't, I don't know if they're marketable. I had a million reasons not to do it. So I just kept failing and failing and failing. 
And I have this very good friend by the name of Nicholas Butler, who's also a novelist. He's up in Wisconsin, a uh, great writer. Uh, and I've been writing him letters. And you know, he called me one day and he said, you know, Matthew, you write me these beautiful letters. Why don't you write a book in letters? I said, Nick, that's a great idea. <laughs> and I went in and I told him this. I said, Nick, so I have to write a book of life. She said, I told you that six months ago. What have you been doing? You know, just, she was so angry with me. Um, but I think it was just having someone else second it. And I, I had been so exhausted, you know, failing and failing. And when I sat down and tried to write this book in letters, I wrote, Dear Carl, and it just, it just came. You know, so I tried to write this book for seven years you know, a traditional narrative, and I just couldn't do it. So my analyst would say to me that Psyche blocked me so that this book could come out the way it was supposed to come out. And that would have sounded strange or mysterious to me before I, I got into Jungian analysis, but this journey over the past five years for me after getting sober, I realized that a lot is going on in subconscious. You know, there's this... And particularly with art, you know, I, as a young man, I thought, well, I'm writing this book, I have control over everything. And I look back now and say, it's so little of it I had control over. You know, it was my life circumstances, it was the things that were going on, you know, um, there was so much that I was not aware of. And now when I have my analyst who knows me quite well, when he, when he reads my books, he pulls out all kinds of things that like, I, I was not thinking about. And he'll say, you know, look at this, and, you know, this is linked to this, and you had this dream about this, and I'm like, whoa, you know. And so I've learned to be humble, you know, and, and the word that I come up with over and over again with the art and when I'm speaking is you learn to serve. You know, there's, there's something else, whatever you want to call that, there's something greater at work, and you've got to be humble and you've got to serve. And, you know, so with this book, it needed to be written in letters. I didn't want to do it, and I couldn't do it any other way, but as soon as I submitted to that, uh -huh. it came right out. You know, it's very easy to write after that, so. And you also do multi letters um, on your website, which I signed up for yesterday. Um, Thank you, appreciate that. I didn't want to do it before I interviewed you. I didn't okay. want to read those letters and impact the conversation that we're at, because I could talk to Matthew for days. <laughs> I appreciate that. Um, tell us about, because I'm sure there are some people out there that are probably going to be interested in, in those monthly letters, and what exactly is that that you do? Yeah, so I started, um, it, basically when I when I got sober, I, I kind of disappeared for a while, deleted all my social media apps, and um, I needed to take some time away. I had done the whole Hollywood thing for a while, and that, that got busy for a while, and um, so, uh, I just took some time where I didn't really communicate with people for a long time and then I wrote this book and I sold it and I just I didn't want to get on social media because I just find social media is not a good place for honest communication. Some people have a good time with it and that's fine but for me I felt like I don't want to say more than just a sentence on Twitter. It's just not, it's just, it just didn't work for me. So. I thought, well, how can I be authentic and communicate with people? And I said, what if I just wrote a personal letter every month to whoever wants to read it, you know, and, and just be honest? And so I started by telling people where I've been, you know, why I've gone away for a while, and just trying to be super honest and be me, you know, in a way that felt authentic. And people liked it and signed up, you know, it's free. You know, you can sign up on my website, matthewquickwriter.com. And uh, I send one out every month on the 21st of every month. And um, it's just a conversation that I have with people. And you know, some people seem to really enjoy it. And it's just me being authentic. I'm looking forward to getting my first letter. <laughs> Appreciate that. What's next for Matthew Quick? Is you are the light gonna be a movie? Are there talks? Is there another book coming? Can I have an arc? Is there another book coming? <laughs> one? Well, I wrote the screenplay for We Are The Light. I wrote it uh, earlier in the year. Thank you very much. Yeah. And, um, I'm working with some producers, and so it's out with directors now, so we're trying to find a director. Hollywood is um, one ever, never-ending chase, you know, so all my books have been optioned. I've had two made into movies, and, um, you know, you get close, and things fall apart, and people come and go, and already we've had directors attached to this and have gone, and, you know, so it's, uh, we're hopeful, fingers crossed. I feel like it's the best screenplay I 
I've written so far, but you know, I'm not exactly um, objective. You know, my, my wife says it's the best one too. My agent said so too. But you know, so we're hopeful. I think it could be a great film. And we're working on putting together the reason you're alive. It's got some new interests. We have an, an actor, a famous actor, attached to that, which we're excited. And, I, and I'm working on a novel. So you know, and I'm not going to say too much more about okay, that. Okay. But, yeah. but if we need a small town for we are the light. <laughs> yeah, I'm gonna have some filming right here, maybe. Look, if it needs to be in a bookstore instead of a movie theater, that's <laughs> over there. <laughs> yeah, maybe do some casting right here. Yeah, yeah, totally. All right, I can see it. I can see it. Well, I want to thank. I want to open it up for the audience um, to ask some questions, but I want to thank you for coming out here for us, um, for taking the time out, traveling and sitting here and just talking with us. And I'm, I'm gonna let you guys ask questions, but can you just please give Mr. Quick another It's such a beautiful evening to be here with you. You guys are great, so thank you. Yeah, it's perfect weather. So nice. All right, all right. Uh, again, well, we got hands flying up all day. Um, <laughs> All right, I'm gonna try to work this. I know this book club is over here. I got a young author in the audience. Who's my author? Miss Arthur Oh, there she go. I know you got some questions. Well, let's start here. What's your name? My name is Ana Raquel, and I'm Puerto Rican. So you know, I don't know if you have, uh, if you know some Spanish because you said you talked about Peru and you went to Peru and all that. But anyway, my question is, uh, what's a most memorable book signing for you? Something that happened in a book signing that was like unbelievable. Um, uh, it's, there's there's a lot of um, nice moments at book signings. You know, um, I had one book signing a while ago. It was for one of my YA books where um, it was just a small signing in a Barnes and Noble. I don't even remember what city I was in, but there was a young woman. I think she might have been. 17 or 18 at the time and she walked in and she was so excited that she literally couldn't speak and she just burst into tears and it was not like a, a sad tears it was a happy tears and then she couldn't speak with me and we took selfies and her mother was kind of rolling her eyes like you know i don't know what's going on but later she just wrote me a this beautiful letter about you know just how much the book had meant to her and got her through a tough time and it, it really felt genuine. It didn't feel performative. It felt like she had had this transformative moment with the book and um, it was one of those moments when you realize, uh, you know, that, that, that the work is, is having a life beyond you. And when a kid, especially a teenager, reads the work, they have a fantasy of who I am. You know, they don't really know who I am. They're, they're projecting all kinds of stuff. And you just kind of have to step aside and get out of the way of that moment. You know, you just kind of have to hold it because um, you just realize that it's, it's, it's greater than you. You know, and I don't think that that had anything to do with me as a person. I think she sat down with my book as a tool and she was able to work things out with herself with that tool that I had provided for her, but it really had nothing to do with me whatsoever. But it was just this really great moment where you see that art had a profound influence on somebody. Um, and I don't even think it was me, I just think it was the reading experience for her, and it really renewed my faith in, in what we do. You know, this, this idea of just trying to record the human experience, put it out there, and um, hopefully put some good into the world. But, you know, and I think of moments like that, and, you know, that moment is, to me, more sacred than, you know, going to a movie premiere, or going to the Oscars, which are sort of great in their own ways, but they don't rejuvenate your faith in art the way that those kind of simple moments. I also had a moment in this last tour where a woman just came up, and she just put a gold um, sobriety coin in my hand and just looked me in the eyes and said, just kind of nodded, like almost like she was with me. Um, I didn't go the AA route, like I didn't go through AA, but when I was talking about my sobriety through book tour, you just see people and they would, they would, you just see that they understood what you've been through. And so like that, that sense of community, 
um, was really beautiful as well. You know, of course, like doing things like going to the Philippines or, you know, I went to Rio and, you know, experiencing um, different cultures and how, how they interact with books was, was also phenomenal too. So, and also I think my, my, my favorite experience was going to the um, Powder Springs, Georgia tonight. It was fantastic, yeah, so, yeah. <laughs> Hello. Thank you so much for your book. Congratulations on five years sober. That's a big deal. Thank you. I wonder, can you talk to us some about, in addition to positive masculinity, the character of Jill in your book? Did you have someone in your life that was that caring figure that you got some of that character from? Yeah, you know, I mean, the easy answer is to talk about my wife, Alicia, who is, you know, just kind of a rock for me and has been through all the highs and lows, you know, since I was 19. You know, she's, she's ridden that, the whole roller coaster with me. So, um, you know, she really is, is a rock and um, she, she, she does have a little bit of Jill's fire. Uh, I, I have a good friend um, who lives in Denmark uh, by the name of Liz Jensen and she's been my pen pal. Since Civil Lines came out, she blurred my book in the UK. She, she's real fiery. She, she's very political. She's kind of the opposite of me. Um, but like, she's got that kind of chutzpah of Jill as well. And when she read the book, she's like, oh, Jill's my favorite character by far. <laughs> she, she really liked Jill. Um, so I wasn't consciously thinking of her when I was writing the book, but she's like this very strong woman. And, you know, and I, I talk about positive masculinity. You know, I think about Darcy in the book, you know, who's Jill's best friend. Lucas literally elevates her into a goddess, you know, in the book. And, you know, so this the divine feminine is very strong in the book as well. And so, you know, I, I talk a little bit more about positive masculinity because I just think as a culture, we don't talk about that as much. But, you know, the divine feminine is, is just as important. You know, the, 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 the queen is just as important as the king. You know, they're both, both integral to a healthy society. My name is Andrew West, and I want to ask you, you talk about toxic um, masculinity. How come if a guy, this, this happened to me several times, there's a couple of ladies went by and I go, met to my friend, man, a beautiful woman. And a couple of guys go by and say, they're a handsome guy, and they look at me like, what's your problem? So it's very much me. I'm not sure I got the whole question. So you said somebody. We, we were standing with a group of guys and a couple of ladies went by and I said, I made a remark, they were beautiful. Yeah. And then a couple of guys went by late and I said, man, they're a handsome guy. And they all looked at me like, dude, what is your problem? Because somebody called you handsome? No. Or, or because you called a woman beautiful? Yeah, and, I, and then some guys went by and they said they were handsome. Oh, I see, I see. And your friends don't look, like you calling them yeah, handsome. Yeah, what's wrong with that? I, I don't know your friends, but uh, I, I don't think there's anything wrong with it. Um, you know, I think sometimes people just, you know, they're not comfortable, I guess. But, um, you know, I, I, I think it's okay to call anybody beautiful or handsome. You know, I, I have no problem with that. My soul loves the best of your soul. Yeah. Thank you. I appreciate that. Yeah. <laughs> Good evening. And my question is, does writing uh, energize or exhaust you? Do you experience it as a calling to be fulfilled or a hobby to be enjoyed or both at different times in different ways? Well, I think I, I think it's more a calling for me, the writing. Um, and it, it can exhaust you. You know, um, there's a lot of fantasies that people have about being a full-time fiction writer and I think initially you kind of need the fantasy, you know. Um, you know, for me, I thought, well, if I could publish a book or if I could hit the times list or if I could make it a movie made, my life would be amazing, you know. And, and those things were wonderful things. They were very privileged things to happen. But the writing life is largely, a, it's a struggle. You know, you're alone in a room and you're facing your demons and you're, you got that blank page and. I always say, um, 
you know, the odds are of, of publishing any book are so extraordinary. Like every time you sit down to write a book, you're, you're facing tremendous odds. And so the only people who really will take on those odds over the long haul, like sometimes people will publish one book and they, they just do it and they wanted that experience and that's great. But I've been doing this full time since 2004 and all the people I know who write fiction over, you know, 10, 20 years, there's a little bit of an obsession about it, you know, and, and, and that can be both good and bad. You know, there are a lot of easier ways to make a living, um, but I think you have to get kind of tapped, you know, and you get, you get called to do this. And when young people ask me, you know, should I be a writer or how can I make it, I, I, I always tell them that there's really nothing that I can say to you that, you know, it, it, if you're going to do this, you're going to do it, and nobody's going to be able to talk you out of it. And if someone could be able to talk you out of it, then you should be doing it. Um, you know, it's it's not something that um, you go into lightly. You know, when I did when I first started writing, I, I sold I quit a tenure position in a great high school, and I sold my house, and I and I just put all the chips on the table. I would never advise anyone to do that. Like, I look back now, I'm almost 50 now, I'm like, what was that kid thinking? Like, that was, I, and I can't believe it worked out. Like, it's, it's, it's nuts, but I didn't think I had a choice. And a lot of people said to me, oh, that was so brave. Like, it was really brave of you to do that. No, it wasn't brave. It was that every day I walked into that school, I thought, I can't do this anymore. Like, I, I, I'm gonna go, Something bad's going to happen if I don't make a change. It was like a last desperate act of trying to save myself. It felt like I had to do this. And like that, that was, you know, it didn't really feel like a calling. A calling sounds like something nice, you know, like as if like you get a tap on the shoulder and say, hey, you're chosen. But it was, I feel horrible. I need to figure this out. And I think a lot of my writing friends, particularly people that write the type of stuff that I do, you know, not genre stuff. Uh, it's usually because they had something not great happen to them in life and they feel like they need to figure it out somehow. You know, and that's the thing that keeps pushing them. Um, and even my friends that are writing friends that don't believe that about themselves, like I believe that about them. Like when I talk to them, when I meet people, you always get to that point in the conversation where they tell you about their, their history and they tell you about that thing and their child like, oh, that's why they're a writer. You know, that's it, you know. Um, I had an experience once where a, a young, what was it, like a woman in her 30s, she's a librarian, she had a 12-year-old daughter, and she said, my daughter wants to be a writer. What should I do to help her? I'll do anything to help my, my, my daughter become, you know, fulfill her dream of being a writer. And I just, I laughed and I said, if you, if you really want her to be a writer, the best thing you do is tell her not to do it and be really mean about it. Like, <laughs> because they're the people that become writers, you know, like my father screamed at me, told me, to, I so I got to show him, and that was the fuel I had to get through all those bad experiences. But it was also, you know, when you go to try to publish something, everybody says no to you. You know, it's and then you get reviewed, and people say awful things on the internet. It's, it's you have to be able to withstand that. And so, you know, it's kind of a joke. I was saying to that young, young librarian, but writers are not people that have had easy lives for the most part. There are people that have had conflict, there are people that have had troubles, there are people that need to work things out. There are people that have knots inside of them that are trying to undo the knots. And so if nobody put those knots in there, you don't have anything to undo. You know, so, um, so I would say calling, but you know, not in a way that it was, you know, it wasn't like the, the, the clouds parted and God came down and anointed me, it was just, I felt like I had this thing in me that was needed to get out, you know, so. You been feeling like that? <laughs> you feel like that? <laughs> write it, write it. We're waiting on your book. We're waiting on your book now. There we'll you go. If it's in you to do, you have to do it. I'm you just it. have to. Hi, my name is Danny Brown. Uh, Julia actually recommended your book. I walked into her bookstore one day. And Thank you, Julia. Yeah, yeah so I feel like your, your book found me. And I didn't know much about the book outside of the, whatever was written, I think, on the front or the back of the book that gave a brief description. And it talked about um, masculinity or toxic masculinity. And as I read the book, I was like, eh, I don't really see it. But it was just so well written, and I just found a very beautiful story. 
but sitting here and listening now and then reflecting back on the book, I absolutely can see, you know, where the, the toxic masculinity pieces come in. And so in your experience, whether it's, you know, personal or through your research, do you feel that um, the lack of vulnerability that men display varies based on culture or race, or do you feel like it's just something that men in general struggle with regardless of those factors? You know, I can only speak from my personal experience. Um, you know, I've done a lot of events and they've been quite eclectic and I've spoken with other authors um, from very different backgrounds and different races, different sexual orientations. And when you talk about these things with men, they all nod, you know, and from all different cultures, it's, it's really quite prevalent. And, you know, I think of toxic masculinity. I don't, I don't think of, of Lucas as particularly toxic, but one of the things that he does that I think is a form of toxic masculinity is that when he goes through this tragedy, he, he withdraws, he holds up. And that, that, was, um, that was something that I, I've done a lot. You know, in, in the culture that I grew up, like if you had strong emotions, you're supposed to hide that. You're, supposed to, you're not supposed to bring that to the group. You know, you're supposed to go away and deal with that on your own. And that, that is very unhealthy. Um, and, I, and I think that one of the sad things that I've noticed is that it's not that men don't want a place to go, it's that they don't have anywhere to go. And it's that they don't feel that they're allowed. And I've done similar talks, and I remember I was in St. Louis, and there was one man that came up. And, and to be honest, with most of the talks I do are pretty much 80% women, you know, and they're set up by, um, they tend to be set up by librarians or, or booksellers, and, and primarily they're mostly women, you know, so there's, uh, I think we have a, a lot of work to do to reach men in the community. Um, but this man in St. Louis came up to me, you know, and we had had a conversation similar to this, and he had tears and said, he's like, I wish I could go and have a place like this every week, once a week. But I know that next week there's not going to be somebody here to have this conversation. And again, it wasn't me. Like, it's not that he wanted me to be there. He just wanted somebody to be there. And I tell this story all the time. My, my uncle, uh, if you read The Reason You're Alive, is, is very much inspired by my uncle Pete. He was a Vietnam vet who was very gruff, had a lot of guns, was... Um, you know, had a brain tumor and had no filter and would just say the most offensive things. Like the names, his pet names for me, I couldn't say them now because I'd get canceled immediately. Uh, but there was the, that was how he told me he loved me. And it was one Christmas, I tell the story a lot because it's, it's a really important story to me. It was one Christmas when I was maybe 25. I said to my uncle on Christmas morning, I said, Pete, this is the day that I'm finally going to give you a hug. And he said to me, if you hug me, I will stab you. I will go into my gun closet and get a gun and shoot you. I, and he had, like, he literally had these guns. He said, I will kill you if you hug me. And I said, Pete, it's coming, so you better prepare yourself. And so we had our Christmas, and we opened the presents. And at the end, I said, okay, Pete, it's time for the Christmas hug. And he was cursing at me, and I, I put my arms around him. And he started punching me as hard as he could in the back, kidney punch, like, let go, I don't want to hug you. And I just, I just wrote him, you know, I just, I just held on and held on. And after a minute or so, the punching got slower and slower. And then I, I kind of looked out of the corner of my eye and this beautiful grin just bloomed on his face. Like he wanted that hug so bad, but he just didn't feel like he was allowed to have that hug. And I remember that He's no longer with us. I, I think that's the best thing I ever did for my uncle. Like just getting through all of that, you know, crazy talk, all the, you know, defenses, and just giving him that hug that he needed. And then after that, he started calling me all the time and telling me Vietnam stories and, you know, things about his life. But Pete was also this guy that was the first one to buy my book every time it came out. And when I told him I wanted to be a writer, he said, Risk and reward, take a big risk, get a big reward. You know, like he was on board. And I remember I published Sort of Like a Rockstar, which was this YA book about this, this young woman um, who was homeless. And, you know, it, my publisher had this very girly type cover, not to use gender specific language, but, you know, it was very colorful. It didn't look like a book that a Vietnam vet that was always in camouflage would wear. 
first day he was out there buying that book, and I thought he, for sure he would make fun of me. And when he read that book, he called me on the phone. He said, I read your book, and I got something to tell you. And I thought, for sure he's going to lay into me. He's, and he said, don't let those movie rights go cheap. This is a great story. <laughs> and so he was constantly surprising me. Like, he was this guy that just wanted to connect and wanted to love. But, you know, somebody sent him to Vietnam when he was 18 told him to kill people. You know, he, that was taken away from him, you know? So it was always trying to chip away from that, you know, so. I can tell you, uh, Matthew, quick, if you ever really want to measure the success of what you're saying, uh, people are going to be finished with you before your time is up, but when they've gone past our time, <laughs> by 25 well, great. it's been pretty good. So I'm not going to be the one to set, but I know we are actually beyond our normal time. So I want to, I know there's some more questions. Don't be afraid. Uh, it's not many times we get someone in our community whose speech is healing, insightful, and also writes books. And some of y'all got questions. That, you know, he's been around the world. He's wrote books. He's had a lot of experiences. Now it's your time. So if we got any more questions, let's take, I'll take two more, and I'm going to give you back the mic after that. Okay? So we got one here and one here. All right, that's it. Go on, go on. How you say it? Go on once, go twice. Okay. All right. Hi, my name is Corlissa Wilson. Um, one statement and one question. Um, I'm a professional counselor and I supervise counselors. And we use your movie, Silver Linings Playbook, to analyze and diagnose all of the characters in your book. Oh, wow. So it brings up some very interesting conversations. So I can't wait for this one. Um, also, Lucas was a school counselor. Mm -hmm. And several times during the book, in the book, you reiterated the difference that he made in the lives of the students. Was there school counselors that made a significant difference in your life, and if so, at what level? It really wasn't a school counselor for me. Um, I had a, a Sunday school teacher um, that was made a significant difference in my life. My, my Sunday school class was was known as the class that nobody wanted to teach. <laughs> we were, I guess we were really bad. I, I think it hurt our feelings, actually, because people would come, and then they would leave, and then this kind man came, his name was Mr. Dunn, and I remember he had a son who had cerebral palsy, and, and he was an adult, and he had to dress Michael for church every, and, you know, it was a big job, and, and he would come in, and he gave us donuts, and he would listen to us, and he would ask us about our life, and it was the first time when I felt like we had a Sunday school teacher that loved us, like that really saw, like didn't look at us and say, oh, this is the bad class, these are the bad boys, I don't want to be, like he wanted, it felt like he wanted to be with us, and he opened up his home, and he would have us over for dinner, and at the time, I remember feeling just wonderful around Mr. Like, I felt like this is somebody who loves me and actually wants to be around me, and that was profound, I didn't understand how profound it was at the time, but looking back, that was really profound. In my high school, I was, I just kind of tried to blend in. I didn't really, I didn't really try very hard at school. I didn't go to a very academic high school. And I just kind of blended in and not a lot of people noticed me in that high school. And I, I look back on that and um, it makes me sad for that young man. And I think when I taught, I was always trying to notice the kids that had the things that were going on that I had going on. and. Um, and I had a radar for that. So I think that the success I had as a high school teacher was very much informed by the fact that there was not a lot of people paying attention to me when I was in high school. So not that I, I wanted that experience, but you know, maybe for a reason. They're paying attention now. Oh, thank you, I appreciate that. <laughs> they are paying attention now in school. All right, our last question for tonight. Yeah, I grew up in Oak Glen, and I taught in Haddonfield. Okay. I went to Collinswood High School. Okay. Montclair, New Jersey. So yeah, yeah. got the Jersey connection. There you go. But I, I really tied in, I haven't read your book, 
I, I'm afraid to say I haven't even seen your movie, so I apologize. But I'm no worries, it's now. time to remedy that. <laughs> Absolutely. Absolutely. Julia can help you out. Yeah, yeah, help me out right over there. I do, it's, it's less of a question and more of a, an acknowledgement of what you talked about with trauma. I do work with diversity and healing around trauma with horses as part of the process. Horses are such uh, somatic animals and they, they help absorb some of the negative energy that's coming out of some of the conversations. I'm dying to read what you talked about and hearing what you, you described, the shooting, and all these things that we're hearing about with uh, all the young people that are being challenged to kill in this society. So thank you. It's more of an acknowledgement and a, and a thank you for that because it sounds like what you're doing is right in line with all of that and your experiences are so incredibly important. So thank you. That's a beautiful way to end the night. Thank you so much for that. I really appreciate that. Yeah, thank you. Shout out to him, yeah. Shout out to him, yeah. Yeah, thanks up there. Right <laughs> over there. They go over there, they got, they got look, Javinci, all kind of designer clothes. Right over there. Well, I just want to say um, thank you, Matthew. Um, for you guys, Matthew's going to hang around, he's going to sign books over there. There are books um, still available, you can get them at a discount. Um, if you want to again pay some forward, we do have some giveaways. Did everybody get a ticket? Okay. Before we go into these giveaways though, I'm going to stand up and give you the much deserved applause for the community. So I thank you. Um,